How's it going, everyone? Hope you're all having a good day today. Were there any questions over sections 5.3 or 5.4? Okay. Today we're going to cover section 6.1. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll just cover 6.1 today. Yeah, the plan is next week on Tuesday we'll cover 6.2. On Thursday we'll review and then Tuesday following we would, would take could be our test um, although probably I'll give you between next Thursday and uh, the following Wednesday evening I have that available for you to uh, take the exam so anyway so Section 6.1, or Chapter 6, is on the topic of discrete probability distributions. Um, a lot of what we've looked at so far is uh, continuous to a degree. It, well, not, not necessarily continuous, but uh, we, we looked at uh, a lot of things that were uh, sorted by groups. So we had a bunch of different classes. We were looking at things like that. Um, in this particular section, or, or this chapter, we're looking more at uh, probability experiments which have, a, in a lot of cases, a more limited number of outcomes possible and a um, established probability for each of the outcomes. And... Um, using that to build what we, now we, we call it a uh, discrete probability distribution but it's basically like a frequency distribution like we've been doing all along with just a limited number of uh, categories basically um, so it's going to be some similarities to things that we've already done but there are going to be some other topics that we cover in this section as well we may not take the, the full time today, which is all right. Uh, you know, whatever time we need to finish the section, I think that'll be good. Um, anyway. So. Section 6.1.
discrete random variables. Focus is a little slow today. Sorry about that. Um, so, when we look at discrete random variables, let me go ahead and define that first. We'll define a random variable first. random variable is a numerical measure of the outcome of a probability experiment so its value is determined by chance The main thing there is that the outcome is determined by chance, and that what makes that's what makes it a random variable. Um, because when we go up and uh, you know, if we're, if we're just going asking around people, what's your favorite color? That's not really a random variable, but because that's based on their everyone's personal preference. Okay, it's a variable. It's a categorical variable, but it's not a random variable. Okay, a random variable will be uh, when you ask someone uh, about their children, whether their children were sons or daughters, and that that's more random because we don't partially because we don't entirely understand the mechanism by which that's chosen, but roughly a fifty percent. 50-50 uh, outcome on that, just from uh, what we would call uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, empirical empirical probability. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it could be anything. I mean, just as long as the outcome is determined by chance, it makes it a random variable. And it could be continuous or discrete. Of course, in this section, we are focusing on discrete. But, uh, again, uh, we use discrete and continuous here in the same context as we did in Chapter 1, where we're talking about whether uh, a variable is uh, quantitative and discrete or quantitative and continuous. Same principles here. I mean... Discrete in this case means that we're just looking at uh, uh, a minimal, not necessarily minimal, but we're looking at a finite number of values that are possible as outcomes for these random variables, and we don't necessarily have all the values in between. Okay. So, I mean, it's just depending on what we're focusing on. Um, I mean, the, the outcomes may change, but again, not going to have a whole lot of them in a lot of these cases. We'll see a relatively small number, like I said, compared to other problems we've seen previously. Anyway, so a discrete random variable.
this is a random variable that has a finite or countable number of values. Yeah. Sorry, I said I said finite, and then I wrote down discrete. My bad. The word countable is a dangerous word in mathematics. Let's not dive too far into that one. dangerous like it, harmful but dangerous is how far we can go discussing it um, all right so a discrete probability distribution that's the next thing to look at it really follows the same rule as any other probability distribution or frequency distribution um, because we are talking about probability though well, no, it's still the same rules. Um, it's, it's much like a relative frequency. Okay. So similar to how we covered those before. Um, in this case, uh, each outcome... There's two, two conditions. Each outcome has a probability between 0 and 1. And two, the sum of each outcome's probability is one. Okay. And those are actually the same rules that we mentioned in chapter five when we talked about prob just normal probability distributions like we were starting off with there you know all the probabilities have to be between zero and one and they have to add up to one it's identical so part part of uh, what we do in our problems here are again correctly identifying um correctly identifying whether a probability distribution, a discrete probability distribution, is uh, valid or not. And again, it's valid because it meets both of these requirements. So if we have a probability distribution where one of the probabilities has a negative probability, or the sum of the probabilities is greater than one or less than one, by a you know, uh, not <laughs> where where the difference is not. Uh, not because of rounding error, um, we're significantly different, I would say, um, then we would know those are actually not valid distributions. So it's similar to problems that we looked at in uh, 5.1, I believe this one was. Anyway, we do introduce one thing that's a, a little bit different or, or new in this particular section, and that is the mean of a discrete random variable. So we're going to say mu is equal to the sum of each um, outcome x 
times their probability p of x. Okay. Remember our notation, the, the capital sigma here means we take the sum. In this case, because we have it in parentheses, we'll, we'll have the product first and then add up the sum of all those products. Now, let me go ahead and find a, a problem for us to work here. So this is problem 18 on page 324. In the following probability distribution, the random variable x represents the number of marriages uh, an individual age 15 years or older has been involved in. Now what's typical is that we see x and p of x as columns. I'm going to add a third column here for x times p of x because one of the things that we want to do is uh, find the mean of this um, probability distribution. So let's write down with our x's go from 0 to 5. Zero is point two seven two. Uh, one is point five seven five. We have point one two one. Some of you might be having flashbacks to standard deviation calculation. This is nowhere near as bad. So let me reassure you there. Okay. Now this is a random variable because if we walk up to a, a, any random individual on the street, assuming you know the whole virus thing or, or whatever it is, uh, is over with, if we can walk up to someone and talk to them. Um, And we ask them how many how many times or how many how many marriages have you been involved in? It's a very scientific statement. It's not really conversational. How many marriages have you been involved in? Anyway, um, it's very precise though. Um, and, and and the number they give us, we, we anticipate will be anywhere between zero and five. If it's more than that, then uh, it's not really represented on this chart. And probably the five here might actually mean five plus. Uh, but again, very rare for that to happen. Uh, outside of specific individual, individuals who may or may not be part of uh, Hollywood. Anyway, so multiply, we can calculate x times p of x by multiplying across the x times the p of x for each individual outcome. It's like 0 times... 0.272 is just 0. 1 times 0.575 is 0.575. 2 times 0.121 is 0.242. 3 times 0.027 is 0 0.081. 4 times 0 0.004 is 0.0. 0, 1, 6, and then 5 times 0, 0.001, 0, 0, 0.005. Now we know the probabilities add up to 1, but then what these add up to now 
adding these together, this will be our mean. Okay. So let's see, we add those together. It's uh, 7, 8, 14, 19. We carry 1, 8, and 8 is 16, and 4 is 20. 21, we carry 2, so 9. Nine one nine. Okay. So we would say the the average individual, based on the results of this this uh, the survey that created this uh, probability distribution, or or however we gather the information, uh, since since the methodology is not given, um, yeah, maybe from census data for all we know. Um, I don't know if they asked that on the census. I don't think they asked that. Just current marital status. Anyway, so the average number of marriages and in a random individual has been part of is about 0.919. So, on average, their randomly selected individual will have been married once, maybe. So, anyway. Not quite once, but closer to one than anything else, of course, as we see here. So this again, this number is the average number of times, in this case, that a randomly selected individual will have been married um, or involved in a marriage. Um, and so, depending on the number that we get here, you know that that tells us tells us. Uh, a little bit about this data set. Okay. Now, the um, I'm missing something. One of the things that you notice. Um, One of the things that we uh, also could find here is a standard deviation. It's a slightly different formula than what we had covered previously. Actually, it's not that different, to be honest. Um, so what we could do here is make a, a, another column This would be x squared times p of x. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how to do this one on the calculator. Um, I'm sure there's a way. And it, and it may actually be that it's the same formula, just kind of in disguise. Um, yeah. That's an easier formula, I think. Um, so we would go ahead and find, can the mean be greater than one? The mean can absolutely be greater than one. Uh, part of the issue here is that one is our highest probability. So because one has the highest probability of occurring, oh, right here, sorry. And the next highest one is zero. We expect the mean so to be somewhere in this range because that represents over 80% of the individuals right there. So that's kind of the center to to our data, basically. Okay, so but it really depends because if we said, okay, uh, what number, what would be the mean if we roll a six-sided die? Well, we we can roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six with equal probability. So the mean would actually be halfway between the one and the six, which is three point five. So the mean on a, uh, uh, the roll of a die is actually 3.5. It really just depends on, on what the data represents and what it's telling us. Okay. 
Now, here, let's just go through and fill out these columns. Uh, 0 squared times anything else is still 0. 1 squared times p of x, 1 times 0.575, still 0.575. 2 squared is 4 times 0 0.121, so that will be 0.484. 3 squared is 9 uh, times 0 0.027. That's 180 and uh, 63, 240, so 0 0.243. 4 squared is 16 times 0 0.004, which is 0 0.064. And 5 squared is 25 times 0 0.001, so that's 0 0.00, or no, 0 0.025, sorry. And again, adding up this last column, carry 2, 10, 21. 2, 11, 13, we have 1.91, 391, sorry, and so our standard deviation this turns out to be, we'll do sigma, uh, one of the things that you'll notice that we do here is that because we're talking about a discrete random variable, instead of saying just mu for the mean, we'll give it a subscript of x, meaning that's for the random variable x. Same thing here. For the standard deviation, we'll give it a subscript of x because it's for the random variable x, discrete random variable. So this is the square root of the sum of x squared times p of x minus uh, mu x squared. Uh, certainly a lot uh, easier of a formula overall because uh, we just have to add up these two columns and take this one minus and then square this one and subtract and then take the square root. Okay. Let me get the calculator out. We take square root, parentheses, 1.391 minus 0.919 squared, close to parentheses, and so we get a standard deviation of 0.739. Okay. We're not going to spend as much time as in this set of uh, chapters as we did in the last set of chapters finding uh, things like standard deviation. The mean will continue to be very important. And standard deviation will still be important, but we're not going to spend as much time finding them. When we get to chapter seven, in a lot of those cases, they'll just, they're just gonna tell us what the standard deviation is, which is gonna be nice compared to having to calculate it by hand. Although the, the issues that we'll face in chapter seven are entirely different than, than what we're looking at now. So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. But anyway, so we are able to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. just like we, we normally do. Let's see. A 
Let's look at 22. This, this should answer Olani's question. A little bit better. What is the ideal number of children to have in a family? The following data represent the ideal number of children for a random sample of 900 adult Americans. This one's a little bit more based on opinion than actual fact, but nonetheless, it's still a random variable. I mean, everyone's opinion will likely be different on this one, but that's fine. X in this case represents the number of children. And we have a frequency provided rather than a probability. But that's good because it adds some, some other layers for us. I'm going to add two more columns here and we'll talk about those momentarily. Personally, I couldn't imagine having six children, but it's also true that I have zero children myself, so six would be very difficult to have all of a sudden. <laughs> anyway, um, is it 10, 30, 520. 250, uh, 70, 17, 3. Okay. So, first thing we need to do here is go ahead and create the probability distribution. Now, we have, these are our discrete values. 0 through 6, this is the responses that are given in the survey. And we know that 900 adults were sur surveyed, so we don't have to add up this column, thankfully. But if we do add these numbers together, it should equal 900 nonetheless. Um, oh yeah, yeah it, 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 that one actually adds up pretty easy because these these three right here add up to 800, and then 10 and 70 is 880, and then 20 more makes 900. Yeah. Um, maybe for me. Um, so now we want to find P of X. This is the probability. Now, probability here is basically the same thing as relative frequency. Okay, relative frequency and probability share a lot in common. They're technically different concepts, but they're measuring things in the same way. That's probably a good way of saying that. Um, so we calculate it the same way we did the relative frequency, which is to take the frequency of the individual uh, outcome divided by the total frequency. So for zero children, we would take 10 out of 900. And, and so 10 divided by 900, I'm going to get my, this is the, the nerdiest part of my day. I have three different calculators on my desk, and I use all three of them every day. This is my favorite one, though, because it's the easiest to use, or I've, I guess I have the most experience using it, and so I tend to when I need a simple calculation, such as dividing two numbers, I tend to go to it first. I would go to four decimal places here just to have a reasonable amount of accuracy uh, for uh, finding these. Okay, next we have 30 out of 900. Zero, three, three, three. 
And we have 520 out of 900. 0.5778 if we round. Two hundred and fifty divided by nine hundred point two seven seven eight This is a little bit tedious, but at least the steps are easy. Uh, then we have point zero seven seven eight. Oh, finally something different. Point zero one eight. I guess we'll make it a nine. And then three out of nine hundred is going to be like a three. So yeah. Zero zero three three. Okay, and that should add up to one because, or or pretty close to one, depending on the rounding that happened. How many we round, uh, rounded up versus rounded down? Um, let's see that we have twenty four. 28 and 12 is, yeah, this one actually comes out to be exactly one. You can't always anticipate that, but even if it were off, it'd be off by like 0 .0001, 1 or 2 or something like that. Okay. Next, we need uh, x times p of x for this last column. So that means we we'll multiply x times p of x for each of our individual outcomes. So 0 times 0 0.0111, 0. 1 times 0 0.0333, 0 0.0333, 2 times 0 0.5778, 1. 1556 3 times 0.2778 let's see 8334 4 times 0.0778 Uh, 5 times 0 0.0189 and finally 6 times 0 0.0033 So the other thing that we do now is we add up this last column, and, and again, this the sum of the x times p of x should give us the mean of this discrete uh, probability distribution. So I'll put those into the calculator, 0 0.0333 plus 1.1557. 0 0.0333. Eight three three four plus point three one one two plus point zero nine four five plus point zero one nine eight. Okay. And so we get a sum of two point four four seven eight. And so this is our mean. Okay. Now what that tells us since the mean is 2.4478 is the uh, the average uh, what group are we looking at here uh, the average American uh, would prefer to have uh, about two and a half children now this is averaged out over everyone so because we can see right here there's a lot of people that chose two and a lot of people that chose three so we expect the, the mean to be pretty close to those since those are our highest uh, frequency values and our highest probabilities as a result. 
But yeah, we see we have about 2.4, 2.5 uh, children as being the ideal uh, for an American family. Okay. But overall, we're going to see a lot of these different numbers, but this is just what it'll average out to. Does anyone have any questions on that? I did want to demonstrate one problem where the, the mean was greater than 1 because it seems like with probability everything is always between 0 and 1. But it's not necessarily the case, it just depends on what aspect of probability we're looking at. In this case, talking about the mean of a discrete random variable, it could have any value possible, not just between 0 and 1. Again, just depends on the data that we have. Okay, now, hmm. the other topic that we look at in this particular section is expected value. Okay. Now, expected value is actually calculated uh, the same as the mean is. Uh, but the difference for expected value is that this usually refers to our expected uh, profit on a game of chance. So it's, it's usually used in reference to games of chance and our expected winnings. Okay, now when we say games of chance, that means we're, we're gambling now. Um, and we can't get anything too difficult here, like if we start looking at uh, casino games like uh, craps or uh, blackjack, that's a very complicated thing. Uh, blackjack especially because of the, the, the rules that most casinos follow versus you know, expectations, plus the fact that most casinos are using more than one deck of cards, usually four or five decks of cards or higher, um, to hide the, uh, or to better conceal uh, the potential outcomes from people that may be trying to manipulate the game as players. So, um, we're going to look at relatively simple examples. Um, So, yeah, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me present this with a scenario and we'll go from there. What we're going to end up doing is we're going to make a chart a lot like we did right here for 22. It won't be exactly the same, but uh, it'll be pretty close to that, okay?
So a game is suggested to us. At a party. Once we can go to parties again. You will pay one dollar to select a number at random from a hat that contains the numbers one through ten. So essentially we have a 1 in 10 chance of winning, but it's more than that because it depends on how we decide what is a win and what is not a win. For instance, let me outline the, uh, the uh, specific results that we may have here. Uh, uh, for instance, maybe it's uh, if we draw Drawing a five, six, or seven, uh, results in winning a dollar. Okay. Picking the eight or nine. Gets us two dollars. And selecting the ten wins us three dollars. Now, this is the game that we've been suggested, and it actually sounds like a pretty decent game. It's not terrible, but it also is not as good as it might seem, because there's different things that we have to take into account when we are gambling that a lot of people just don't take into account. Um, specifically, we have to take into account the money that we pay up front to participate in the game and then we always have to factor that into the, the money that we win. So, we're, I'm going to make uh, a table with uh, four columns. Um, good enough. <laughs> I'm going to list the outcomes here. This is the net winnings, which will be x. This is the probability of p of x, and then x times p of x. Okay. So we will pay $1 to select a number at random from a hat that contains the numbers 1 through 10. If we draw one, two, three, or four, we lose. So that's one set of outcomes if we draw the one, two, three, or four. If we draw a five, six, or seven, we win one dollar. Five, six, and seven is the second set of outcomes. And we can go ahead and group those together because they all have identical outcomes in this case. Um, eight or nine gets us a different outcome and 10 also gets us a different outcome. Okay. So if we 
select a one, two, three, or four, we know that we lose the game. But uh, when we talk about our net winnings, this is how much our uh, uh, the amount of money we have has changed by choosing to play this game. Okay. And we know that if we draw a 1, 2, 3, or 4, we don't win anything. But what we have to include in that is the $1 that we paid up front. Because we paid that $1 up front, so we've already lost that $1, and then we didn't get it back. So even though it says we, we didn't win anything, we did actually lose a dollar in the process. So now we have $1 less than we did before. So essentially, all of these winnings that are listed have to be modified by this dollar that we paid up front to account for that, okay? If we draw a five, six, or seven, it results in us winning one dollar, but that just means we got our dollar back, and we've now broken even, okay? What would be our net winnings if we happen to choose the eight or nine? Well, we know we get two dollars, but we did pay one up front to play the game in the first place. So what is the overall change of our, uh, our cash on hand, I guess we could say. We've increased our cash by one dollar, you know. What about if we choose the ten? So we always have to temper our expectations based on the amount we had to pay up front to play the game in the first place. And, and that's a, a mistake that a lot of people that are gambling make is they, they don't see that upfront cost as a cost. They're only looking at what they could potentially win. And, and even though this looks like a pretty good game, and it, it actually still... Um, Actually, yeah, it works out to be a fair game, actually, and we'll define what that is in a second. Um, what's the probability that we would choose the one, two, three, or four? Now, we know that overall there are ten numbers in this hat, and they are equally likely to be chosen. So if there's four numbers here out of the ten, Four out of ten gives us a point four probability. For whatever reason, I wrote that really small. Okay. How likely are we to choose the five, six, or seven? What is our probability for this one? Three out of ten, or point three, good. And we can keep going with that same. This one has two outcomes, so that's two out of ten, which is point two. And then finally, a ten is just one option out of ten, so point one. Okay. Now. We want to multiply x times p of x, so we'll take negative 1 times 0.4, so negative 
0 times 0.3, 0. Positive 1 times 0 0.2, so plus 0.2. And positive 2 times 0.1, so that is 0.2 as well. The last thing that we'll do is we'll add up this column. What does this add up to? zero right now what that means I'll zoom out. so we have an expected value of zero In this case, it means that this is a, a fair game. This is called a fair game because um, the person hosting the game uh, stands to neither win nor lose on average, just like the people playing the game. Uh, people playing the game on average will break even. Okay. Now, when what this means when we look at our expected value is it, it doesn't mean that every time we play the game we're going to get zero. We know there's a, a lot of different possibilities here. Okay. But it means if we play the game ten times, we may get, uh, we may lose a dollar sometimes, we may win a dollar sometimes, we may lose nothing, we, we, we may gain two dollars. But if we play the game ten times, we expect to be breaking even. Uh, over that ten times, whether we win or lose or or or, or don't get anything, overall our <laughs> money that we started with should be identical to the money that we finish with if we play this game an increasing number of times. Uh, basically, this is where the law of large numbers still applies. But the idea is that if we play this game a lot of times, that on average, we're neither going to win nor lose money in the long run. And that's what's called a fair game, because it's fair that the players, on average, should break even, and that the person hosting the game should break even. So this is called a fair game. Now, uh, since we stand to neither win nor lose money in the long run, Now, every single game, when you walk into a casino, will have a negative expected value. Okay? doesn't matter where the casino is, you have a negative expected value. That's because um, people are there and are in the business of making money, specifically taking your money. And so, even though you may win occasionally, you're still getting money each time you play. Because the expected value is negative, that means on average that, you know, if you can win in the short run, that's fine. But in the long run, you should overall ex be expected to lose. Okay, and, and that's where the, the casino makes their profits from. Is, is people spending time, too much time, in the, uh, in the location and uh, ending up losing money. Okay. Uh, the game that you generally have the the least negative expected value for is actually the game uh, Craps, which is a dice game where um, 
all the outcomes are based on probability alone and not being tilted towards the the, uh, the house's favor as they say every other game there has some kind of mechanism that that puts the game into the favor of the the people hosting the game which makes it a negative expectation for us playing it okay that means that the people hosting the game the the casino owners casino workers that are playing the game they will have a positive expectation because they expect to take our money on average okay lotteries are the same way lotteries have a negative expectation although at least a lottery goes to uh, theoretically it goes to pay for education and other things uh, for the public benefit uh, anyway so that's our last lesson on gambling for the day the, the lesson is try not to do it unless you're just doing it for fun I mean if you're going to Vegas with your friends uh, catch some shows you know walk around and see all the crazy people and if you want to spend some time in the casino just having fun, spending a little money, that's fine too. But don't go there expecting to win big money. You know, that, that's that's the mindset we cannot be in. So. Anyway. Any questions? So again, let me write this over here, negative expectation means we expect to lose money on average. It's possible a game has a positive expectation, but you don't really find those except for some people that are being philanthropic or they, you know, they're just there to have pe help people have fun. Uh, and you would not see that in a significant, um, you won't see that too many times. Um, a lot of the, uh, the games that have uh, fair, uh, that are fair games, uh, they're not necessarily gambling in that sense, but it's still a gamble. So, because it has a zero expectation, it makes it uh, hmm, what's a good way of saying that? It's not as much considered gambling; it's just playing a game. But it's still a gamble. Yeah. All right. Generally, a zero expectation is the best we can hope for, though, for games of chance. So, anyway, uh, let me let me find some homework problems for us, and we will stop there. So we're on page 324. Let's look at number 9, 11, 13. Seventeen, in which I want you to skip part B.
Then uh, 27, I think that's that's all we can look at there. So the first three problems are on determining if a probability probability distribution of discrete probability distribution is valid. Uh, 17 is like that problem that we did with uh, the uh, people uh, describing their ideal number of children. Uh, it has some more questions beyond what we asked, but I think you can manage all of those. Uh, but it does have you find things like uh, the uh, the mean and standard deviation, and it has answered questions about different probabilities. And then 27 is a expected value problem. Um, for what I will give you an expected value on the test, uh, expected value problem on the test. It'll be more like this one that we just went over though than 27. But I wanted you to give. I wanted to give you another problem to, to look at just for for practice purposes. So, all right. Um, so we will leave it at that for today. Hope you all have a, a good weekend, and we will finish up chapter six on Tuesday. So you all have a good day and take care, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.